Hello everyone, it's Dave here again with part two of the events of the cardiac cycle. In this part, we're going to take some of those concepts that we just learned in part one and then actually march our way through the events of the cardiac cycle and tell you how uh, the contraction and relaxation of the two chambers of the heart is accompanied by blood flow in from the veins and then out into the arteries. And we're going to focus on uh, each individual step one by one by one and then at the end we'll talk about a handy little um, graphic method that's used to represent the cardiac cycle called the pressure volume loop. And throughout the this part of the lecture we'll be talking about how some of the things you've heard about previously like the electrocardiogram are related to the events of the heart of the heart cycle and how pressures and volumes change in response to that ECG and how those pressures and volumes can also generate heart sounds. So to, before we get into the, the basic events of the cardiac cycle, I have to give you a quick little reminder of some of the basic anatomy of the heart that we're going to be talking about, which I'm sure you're very familiar with at this point. Um, we're going to be focusing entirely on the left side of the heart, the left atrium and left ventricle, um, but everything I'm telling you or going to tell you will apply to the right heart as well, except that on the right side of the heart, the pressures are all much lower. So on the left side, the pulmonary vein drains into the left atrium, and then blood flows through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then out through the aortic valve into the aorta and out into the circulation. And um, throughout this process, the, the flow of blood through those, those valves is determined by that same equation that I showed you earlier, that Q equals delta P over R. Um, the pressure gradients in the heart are quite low on the, from the atrium into the ventricle, but despite that, the resistance of the valves is so low that it takes a very small pressure gradient to drive a lot of blood flow across a heart valve. So heart valves, when they're healthy at least, have extremely low resistance when they're open. And then they have extremely high resistance, essentially infinite resistance, when they're closed. And so a healthy heart valve is completely open or completely closed and doesn't exist in an intermediate state. As you'll learn in other lectures with other uh, parts of this course, um, diseased heart valves have problems with that. They don't open very well and so therefore they might uh, result in some high resistance instead of the usual low resistance that occurs in a healthy valve. And so when you have high resistance, for example in the aortic valve over here, that means the ventricle has to generate higher pressures, a higher pressure gradient to generate normal blood flow out into the aorta. Okay, so keeping this simple structure in mind, let's march our way, connect the dots through the stages of the cardiac cycle on this plot here. On this plot, uh, we're, we're seeing a time course, essentially, across about a second's time, um, and with the units shown across the top of the plot. And over that time, we're gonna go through a bunch of different events that occur during the cardiac cycle. We're gonna start with the ECG up top here, so you can recognize the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave that you've learned about in the last few couple of weeks. We're going to talk about heart sounds that occur at various stages of the cardiac cycle. And in particular, we're going to focus on pressures that occur at various parts of the cardiovascular system and in the heart. We're going to talk about three pressures in particular. The aortic pressure, which is shown in these open triangles. We're going to talk about atrial, that's left atrial pressure, shown in the open circles. And we're going to talk about left ventricular pressure, shown in the, in the closed triangles. And as we march our way through the cardiac cycle, we're going to basically draw lines between these points and show you how these pressures rise and fall as we progress through the stages of the cycle. In addition, we're also going to talk about left ventricular volume, which is what's plotted along the bottom here in milliliters. And so we're going to see how in these closed circles here, how the volume in the left ventricle changes during the cardiac cycle. Of course, that's the whole point of the cardiac cycle, is for the left ventricle to take in blood from the veins and to eject it out through the arteries and so the left ventricular volume is a crucial uh, feature or a crucial factor that we're concerned with when talking about the cardiac cycle. Okay let's start at the beginning in a phase that uh, phase one here a phase that's typically called diastasis. Diastasis is the period during which the heart is completely relaxed uh, as shown up here on the right both the atrium and the ventricle are completely relaxed and blood is flowing rather slowly in from the veins through the atrium into the ventricle. As a result, the ventricular volume you can see here is slowly increasing during this phase because blood is slowly coming in uh, from the veins, venous return into the, into the ventricle and the atrium. You can see that out here the aortic pressure, which is out here in the aorta, is slowly dropping at this point because the heart is completely separated 
from the aorta, the valve is closed, and as a result, the blood that's in the aorta is slowly draining out into the circulatory system, and so the volume of blood in the arteries is slowly dropping, and because they're elastic elements, that volume decrease is accompanied by a slow decrease in pressure. And so aortic pressure continues to fall throughout this period here. Meanwhile, the ventricular and atrial pressures are rising very slightly during this point because uh, we're adding volume to those vessels. They're elastic vessels, therefore adding volume to them is stretching their walls very slightly and causing a slight rise in pressure. That's the first stage diastasis. Then, of course, what happens is that contraction begins because what we have up here is a P wave in the ECG, which means, as you know, the beginning of atrial contraction. And so throughout this period here, of the ECG, uh, atrial contraction is occurring, and that results in a number of different changes. The most noticeable of which, of course, is right here. You can see a little bump in the pressure in the atrium, and that little bump in pressure, that sudden little rise in pressure, is caused by atrial contraction, which essentially pressurizes the contents of the atrium and causes a rise in its pressure. That is accompanied, of course, by a little bump in ventricular pressure that's essentially parallel to the increase in atrial pressure because that increased atrial pressure drives more blood flow into the ventricle, increasing its volume and increasing its pressure. You can see, however, that the amount of volume that's added uh, to the ventricle in this during atrial contraction, at least in this heart at rest, is actually not particularly high. There's very little volume actually added during atrial systole. Uh, and in fact, in a resting heart, atrial systole does not contribute that much to ventricular volume. This is a somewhat counterintuitive point, but the fact is that when you're at rest, your atrium and its contraction are not particularly crucial for, for filling up your ventricle with blood. Meanwhile, by the way, the aortic pressure is still slowly dropping um, because it's still disconnected from all this by this closed uh, aortic valve. I should also mention that atrial contraction in some people very rarely causes a very small heart sound called heart sound number four, which you don't normally hear in healthy people, but does occur under certain conditions. And you're going to hear much more about the pathological conditions under which you can hear some of these minor heart sounds. Okay, what happens next? Well, what happens next is this. The big QRS complex tells you that ventricular contraction has begun. And so throughout this period here, uh, between 0.2 and 0.4 seconds, essentially, on this plot, ventricles, the ventricle is contracting. And of course, that generates, the ventricle is a huge muscle, the left ventricle especially, and that generates huge changes in the pressure inside the ventricle. And so the red line here, this ventricular pressure right here, suddenly jumps and skyrockets upwards as the pressure inside that ventricle increases because the walls of that ventricle are, are pressurizing and, and contracting and stiffening, essentially. The first thing that happens when that red line rises above the, the line of the atrial pressure, right here, it's a bit messy, um, right about there, um, when that red line, the pressure in the ventricle rises above the pressure in the atrium, what happens, of course, is that that pressure drives backward on the mitral valve here and closes that valve. And so the first thing that happens during ventricular contraction is that the valve between the atrium and the ventricle closes. And that results in a situation which is called isovolumic, which means that both valves, the mitral valve and the aortic valve, are both closed. And so during this initial phase of ventricular contraction, the volume in there is not changing. And you can see that right down here in the left ventricular volume. It's constant during this isovolumic contraction. So it stays the same at the maximum. Meanwhile, the pressure is rising dramatically in there. And so it's pressurizing in there until eventually, of course, um, the pressure inside the ventricle reaches the pressure outside in the aorta and then exceeds it, becomes greater than that aortic pressure. And that, of course, opens the aortic valve and results in the rapid ejection phase when the blood comes shooting out of the ventricle into the aorta. I should also mention, by the way, the first major heart sound right here, S1, is what is the sound that is made when that mitral valve is closed. So at the beginning of ventricular contraction, that huge force of contraction pushing up on the mitral valve actually causes a sound, and that sound is uh, the first heart sound that you hear in normal, healthy individuals. So in the isovolumic contraction phase, pressure is rising, as I said, until right about here, where the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure in the aorta, and as a result, that aortic valve opens, as I've just mentioned. And now, the volume drops precipitously in the volume, in the ventricle. 
So that ventricular volume drops because, of course, this huge contraction is occurring and is pushing a huge amount of volume out into the aorta. And as a result, um, we call this the rapid ejection phase. You can see, however, that despite the fact that the volume is dropping in that ventricle, the pressure continues to rise. And that's because the, the ventricle is contracting so forcefully at this point that despite the loss of volume, um, the, the pressure in there continues to increase. And you can see that the aortic pressure moves along in parallel with it. Although you can see that the red line is always a little higher than the blue line here. That's because there's a delta P there. There's a pressure gradient from the ventricle out into the aorta. And that little tiny delta P of only a millimeter or two mercury is sufficient to drive this huge blood flow because the aortic valve has so little resistance. That, that tiny difference between the two pressures indicates that this is a very healthy valve that is completely open and offering no resistance whatsoever. Um, there's a couple of other points that I haven't mentioned which I should at this point as well. And that is if you look at the aortic pressure, there are actually some little bumps in the pressure that occur in the aortic pressure that are worth mentioning because on the right side of the heart, those little bumps in atrial pressure actually uh, are transferred up to the jugular vein and can be detected by a jugular pulse. And so you can see these little waves of pressure on a jugular, on your jugular vein, and those can also tell you something about the cardiac cycle. The first little wave is called the A wave of the jugular pulse, and that occurs when the atrium contracts. The contraction of the atrium causes this little pulse of pressure in the atrium and on both the left and heart, right sides of the heart that pressure wave goes up into the veins above it. Um, likewise there's another little pressure uh, wave that occurs called the C wave which results from ventricular contraction. So when the ventricle contracts pushes back on that mitral valve it actually generates a little pressure wave that pushes up through the mitral valve into the veins and up to the veins above the heart and that also can be detected as a minor little bump in the pressure on the, jugular, on the jugular vein. So the A and the C wave are both indications of atrial and ventricular contraction in the jugular pulse. Okay, what happens next? Well, of course, we're starting to enter uh, on the ECG, we're getting into the T wave, which means that the ventricle is starting to deep repolarize and relax. And so the, the, the forceful part of uh, ventricular contraction is over, and the muscle cells in that ventricle are beginning to, to repolarize and stop uh, contracting. And so naturally enough, we enter what's called the reduced ejection phase, when the pressure in the ventricle starts to return back downward, and with it, the pressure in the aorta. So once again, they're parallel with each other, um, but the muscle is starting to slow down in its contraction and is, it's still forcefully contracting at this point, but the force of that contraction is slowing and as a result, the pressure is beginning to drop. In part because uh, during reduced ejection, the flow out of the ventricle into the uh, arteries is less than the flow out of the arteries into the peripheral circulation. And so the volume of the arteries is beginning to decline at this point and that means pressures are beginning to decline as well. Okay, and so that's called the reduced ejection phase, and you can see it's called reduced ejection. You can see right here in the ventricular volume at the bottom there that the, the flow rate out of the ventricle has now slowed dramatically compared to the, the rapid ejection phase that we just went through. But there's still volume coming out of the ventricle, but it's clearly slowing down and reaching its minimum pretty soon. Um, finally, at some point, the red line here, or the, the red line goes underneath the blue line, essentially. The red line here goes underneath the blue line, the aortic pressure, so the ventricular pressure drops to the point where the pressure in the aorta is slightly higher than the pressure in the ventricle. And of course what that means is eventually, once the momentum of blood flow is, is reduced, that results in the closing of this valve, of the aortic valve. The aortic pressure becomes greater than the pressure in the ventricle, and so it pushes back and closes that aortic valve, and right about here, and on this particular time, of course, the valve is closed and we now have a situation, once again, just like before, where both valves are now closed in the heart and we have an isovolumic situation where this heart is relaxing at a rapid pace with both valves closed. And so that's called isovolumic relaxation. Once again, there's no change in the volume going on here, as you can see by this flat line at the bottom. The volume stays the same, but the pressure in the ventricle is plummeting at this point as those ventricular muscle cells now completely relax. And so during this phase, you can see the T wave is over. Um, all of these muscle cells are now repolarized and they're basically stopping their contraction and relaxing completely. One more little point up here is that 
the closing of the aortic valve on the, on the, on the left side and the other valve on the, on the right side, those two valve closures both cause minor uh, but quite audible sounds called the second heart sound. In general, in most healthy hearts, those two sounds are quite close to each other, so they more or less overlap. Under certain conditions, as you'll learn in some of your clinical lectures, those two heart sounds can separate, uh, and that can be a useful diagnostic tool under certain conditions. Okay, so we've got uh, relaxation, isovolumic relaxation occurring. Now eventually, this red pressure curve of the ventricle becomes so low that it goes below the green pressure curve of the atrium. As a result, atrial pressure becomes higher than ventricular pressure. And at that point, of course, we've got a pressure gradient across that valve, and the valve will open. And that takes us to the next phase, which is rapid filling, as shown in number seven here. When that valve opens right there, the ventricle is now open to the atrium, and so blood from the atrium can now flow down into the ventricle, and that results in what's called rapid filling, because at that point, there's been a buildup of blood upstream of the heart uh, above that closed mitral valve. Now that valve opens, and the blood can flow down into the ventricle in what's called the rapid filling phase. And you can see that down here, and the ventricular volume suddenly arises in this rapid phase at a high, at a high rate. You get this increase in the volume of the left ventricle. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out is up here, which I didn't mention before, but when, when that um, aortic valve first closes, you get a little bump in the pressure, in the aortic pressure right there, which is caused by the, the, the blood in the aorta bouncing off that closed valve and generating a small pressure wave. And so that's what causes this little bump in the pressure. It's called the dichrotic notch. Um, and that will come in handy as another diagnostic tool for certain purposes. Okay, so we've opened the valve here. Blood flow is going through the atrium into the ventricle rapidly. Eventually we reach this, uh, a more, a slower phase of, of filling, which brings us back essentially to the very beginning of where we started, diastasis. Okay, um, the ventricle pressure and aortic pressure are both dropping here because both of these muscles are still relaxing. As a result, despite the fact that there's a higher volume in that ventricle, it's relaxing so rapidly that it's becoming floppier and allowing uh, higher volume with less pressure, which I'll explain um, in the next module. And so, as a result, pressures are dropping here, and that leads to another interesting point, which is this. This V wave in the atrial pulse. During ventricular contraction, atrial pressure is slowly increasing as the atrium fills up with blood, but then as soon as that valve opens and a lot of that blood pours into the ventricle, that pressure will drop. And so that results in a little peak of atrial pressure there, which is called the V wave of the, of the atrial pulse. And on the right side of the heart, that is transferred as a pressure wave that you can actually detect in the jugular pulse. So we're back to diastasis. We're back to the beginning. Um, there is a minor little heart sound that, it, that is barely audible in some people. And that's the heart sound that results at the end of rapid filling, because that rapid filling rapidly stretches the walls of the ventricle. And in some people, that can create a noise, a sound that can be detected. Sort of like the same as adding, uh, suddenly adding a lot of air to a paper bag, the stretching of those walls results in a, in a sudden little sharp noise that can, that can be detected under some conditions. So we're back to the beginning. Number one, same place we started. Uh, we're, we're seeing a gradual increase in the volume of the ventricle, a gradual rise in the pressures in the ventricle and the atrium, both of which are completely relaxed at this point. And so we're, we're back to the beginning, to the point where Blood is coming in slowly from the veins, filling up those two chambers as they prepare for the next contraction and for starting another cardiac cycle. So that's the basic events of the cardiac cycle. There's another really handy way to present the cardiac cycle, which is called the pressure volume loop and, and is shown on this slide. These pressure volume loops, uh, you'll see them pop up in other lectures and in other clinical lectures as well because they're a very quick and easy way to look at the cardiac cycle in different sorts of hearts under different sorts of conditions. The basic idea is that we're plotting here uh, left ventricular volume versus left ventricular pressure on the y-axis. And what we're doing is plotting the cycle, the heart cycle, uh, starting, for example, at this point here, and plotting ventricular volume versus pressure as the heart makes its way through the cycle in a counterclockwise direction, okay? And so as we move around this loop, we're basically moving around the events of the cardiac cycle, and we're watching how pressure and volume changes in the heart as we make our way through that cycle. 
So for example, we can start out as usual in diastasis right here. The heart is completely relaxed, the ventricle and the atrium are completely relaxed, and we're seeing the final filling, so the volume of the ventricle is slowly filling up to its maximum here, until eventually, at the end of this diastasis, um, the ventricle begins to contract. Ventricular contraction occurs right there in that lower right-hand corner right there. The mitral valve closes because the ventricle pushes back on that valve, closes it, and then we see this sudden increase in pressure which occurs at a constant volume. And you can see this is a vertical line which means that the pressure is increasing but the volume is staying the same. That's isovolumic contraction. Until eventually uh, the pressure in the ventricle is higher than the pressure in the aorta and the aortic valve opens at that point, blood flow occurs rapidly out into the aorta, and we get the so-called rapid ejection phase here, where volume is now dropping in this direction to the left, and pressure continues to rise because that ventricle is contracting so strongly. So volume is dropping, pressure is rising, until eventually it, reach, it reaches a peak, and then during reduced ejection here, the pressure begins to decline slowly until eventually that ventricular pressure uh, is lower than the pressure in the aorta and that aortic valve closes again and then we're back in isovolumic relaxation. So at this point both valves are closed and this heart is relaxing rapidly um, but at a constant volume. So it's a vertical line again, the volume is constant but pressure is dropping dramatically until eventually the pressure in that ventricle is lower is lower than the pressure in the atrium above it and so the mitral valve opens and we get rapid filling a rapid increase in volume that occurs as the pressure bottoms out at the at the end of the cardiac cycle so this loop tells us uh, a lot of really useful information about the cardiac cycle it tells us for example the volumes and pressures at which the valves are opening and closing there's another handy piece of information in this loop which is easily gauged and that is the difference in volume between systole between the end of diastole and the end of systole that volume is the amount of blood that's ejected during a heartbeat and it's called the stroke volume and we're going to talk a lot about it in following lectures the stroke volume um, in a typical healthy person is about 70 or 75 mils as shown on this plot. And the interesting thing about stroke volume is that it's only a fraction of the total volume of the heart. Um, you can see that in this person there's still plenty of blood left. There's still 50 mils left at the end of contraction. And that means that out of the total volume of 125 mils at, at the end of uh, relaxation, only 75 mils of that 125 is ejected and the remainder remains in the heart. And that fraction of stroke volume divided by total volume is called the ejection fraction. And the ejection fraction can, can change dramatically under different conditions and in a number of different disease states. And so it's a very useful diagnostic tool for understanding heart disease. We can also see some other useful information on this pressure volume loop. For example, the pressure at which the aortic valve opens here is essentially equal to diastolic arterial blood pressure, which we're going to talk about in a later lecture and the peak pressure up here is of course equal to systolic arterial blood pressure and so you can see that this person here has a roughly normal blood pressure of about 120 over 80 uh, systolic over diastolic blood pressure okay and with that I think we've gone through the basic features of the cardiac cycle the basic steps of that cycle um, correlated the various pressures and volumes in the cycle with the electrocardiogram and the heart sounds and then I've told you about the pressure volume loop which we'll use in subsequent lectures as a way to quickly demonstrate different sorts of cardiac cycles under different conditions.